wow, this feels kind of ominous. I didn't realize I was going to be on a fashion runway. I uh, dressed this morning to be behind a podium and to share a few tidbits with you about our professional development model in, in Utah. And we are really excited. You can see the enthusiasm from our teachers on the video. I thought I would take a minute to, slides go on now. I thought I would take a, a few moments to talk to you just in general about our system. You have to have infrastructure in place in order for professional development efforts to take root and to go from initiation to integration. So that's what I want to share with you today. And then in a breakout, Diana Sudreth, whom you saw in the video as well, will be speaking more and taking you through a math task if you're a little more interested in how we do that work. So uh, as we started thinking about our data and looking, digging into our data in Utah, we were like many of you. We saw that we were lagging behind in mathematics in particular. We interviewed teachers and we knew that we had a, quite a number of teachers in our elementary schools in particular who did not have the confidence that they needed to teach mathematics with, uh, with outcomes in mind that would enable all students to be college career ready. So we started looking at the data and thinking about what we needed to do differently. Our school board, our state school board, caught hold of the Robert Frost poem, the famous poem, and that phrase about promises to keep really stuck in their hearts and their minds. And they came up with a mission wrapped around that theme of promises to keep. The promise we felt we need to keep for all Utah students is to ensure that they are all college and career ready for today's economy. And that's really something different to think about. The world that, that our students will live in, and you've heard this time and time again, we really don't know um, what the jobs will look like and what the economy will, be look like, will look like. So we have to prepare them for today's economy. And for many students, they're, they're concerned about the possibilities of college and careers. So we started thinking about what are the pillars of success? What are the pillars that we need to start focusing on more uh, deeply and with more concentration focused on all students. And so we took a look at literacy and numeracy, but we realized the lever, of course, as David said in the film, are our teachers. And our professional models, development models were uh, sparse, they were scattered, they were really localized. We didn't have a, a real robust professional development model from the state perspective. And so um, we set out to really be focused on learning-centered instruction. And this is a little bit different than, uh, than what we've seen in the past, which is very teacher-centric. I love this graphic. As a child, I love to collect marbles. My brother loved those steely marbles, for those of you that are old enough to remember those. And um, I've since lost my marbles, and that may come out uh, <laughs> during this presentation. But as a child, I really loved all these really colorful glass marbles. And teachers are a little bit like that. We're a little bit like magpies. We collect shiny bright things and fun activities. I've decided that I want to create a new reality show called Teacher Hoarders, <laughs> uh, because we do tend to collect everything. And teachers, teachers are not really good about letting go of things, and we, we tend to focus on cute activities and fun experiences, and we want to do that because we want learning to be fun for all students. But we're trying to shift that thinking, not, not to get away from fun, but thinking about shifting from assignments to experiences shifting from uh, questions to conversations, that lead to conversations, rather, and that the texts that we engage in really become focused on learning at a deeper level. We want questions to become catalysts for change, not only uh, what's happening in the classroom, but for students' lives. So this, this kind of thinking about learning is a different way of being for us as an entire system. So we have developed standards and adopted standards for not only students, but for our teachers and leaders as well. And while this is a real challenging time to be in education, I'm sure you've heard that and feel that, I think it's a real exciting time to be in education, especially in our state where we have all of these new standards, more rigor, higher standards for all, for students, teachers, and leaders. We adopted the uh, in-task standards in a sense. Um, I had the opportunity to, to work on those standards and really started thinking about what do 21st century learners look like. Well, in our own state, we took the in-task standards and um, played with them a little bit and came up with the Utah Effective Teaching Standards. We've always had a set of teaching standards in our, in our state, the Utah Professional Teaching Standards, but we started looking at the new in-task standards and overlaid those with the Common Core standards that we had also just adopted. 
And we were looking at what are those high leverage standards that overlap for teachers and students. And I've yet to put that in electronic format. Uh, it, it's now a chart, a huge chart, graphic chart, uh, organizer on the back of one of our walls. Someday we'll get that in electronic format. But we started targeting what are those high leverage strategies. If you followed the Measures of Effective Teaching Project, the MET project from the Gates Foundation, we have found that the very thing that promotes, we have focused way too much on a lot of those teaching standards that don't really change practice and change success strategies for students. So the Utah Effective Teaching Standards are reflective of not only the Common Core Student Standards, but also the new INTAS standards. We've developed rubrics and a lot of support materials for these standards. And as you might find in your own state, a lot of people gravitate to a rubric and try to put numbers on it and turn it into an evaluation tool. We have a big caution sign saying, that is not what this rubric is about. We want this to be used for conversation. We want it to be used for preparation programs. I, I can see heads out there, so I know you're out there somewhere. There you are. Uh, we we uh, are using these rubrics for conversation, for preparation, and for professional learning. We have a system in place um, through great educational partners that have provided electronic platforms where teachers take self-assessments and set goals based on these standards. And we think that this is a way to leverage high-quality instruction focused on the kinds of standards we hope to get um, outcomes from from students that are more, much more rigorous and much deeper in understanding with mathematics in particular. We also, at the same time then, um, took a look at the ISLIC standards. I hear rumors that they're redoing those standards for leaders. But we took those and said our leadership needs to look different as well in order to get the kind of outcomes from all students that we're looking for. And so we took the leadership standards and, again, did the same kind of work, bringing a broad variety of stakeholders together, creating rubrics and support materials that will lead to much deeper and richer conversations about improvement for our leaders. And again, those are also connected to the INTAS standards for, for teachers as well as the Common Core standards for students. I love this graphic. I don't know if you can see the words very clearly. Um, this is a gate. This is on a gate as you enter uh, off of Michigan, Ave Michigan Avenue into Harvard. And it says, enter to grow in wisdom. We're really trying to create a, a culture of continual growth for leaders, teachers, and students. And by doing that, we, we have to come in with the attitude that we are all learners together in this system. And that means, a, again, a different way of being and a different way of thinking about our work. When we think about um, implementing our new mathematics core and, and our new English language arts core as well, we have to think about how do we get that to the individual classroom. And that's a challenge when you work at a state office, thinking about how do I interact with each and every teacher in our system. I'm sorry that that slide kind of fell down over that last one, but program implementation really is our role at the state office. And we've had to think strategically about as we roll out new standards, what is the kind of professional development we can provide that makes a difference in the classroom? We've also had to provide technical assistance that enables um, leaders, LEA leaders in our districts and our charters to be able to go back and work with their teachers effectively. So I want to just talk, touch briefly then on our professional learning model. You saw some terms like Utah Core Academy in the video. You heard the term facilitator. So I'm going to sort of play that out for you a little bit so you can see how we're trying to um, do this full scale and yet get it again down to the classroom teacher. We took a layered approach to um, the adoption and the implementation of the Common Core standards. And first, we focused on what we would call the speedboats. Um, if you know Steve Barkley, an educational consultant, he used to talk about speedboats, barges, and rocks. And we have a lot of beautiful lakes here in Utah. And for those of you that have driven a speedboat or been in a speedboat, you think about what literally happens when that speedboat hooks up with a rock. And uh, the rock doesn't get damaged, but boy, your speedboat sure, certainly does. And I think for a long time, we've had systems say, well, we'll have our speedboats go out and learn what to do and then work with some of our teachers who are less, um, who are less excited about implementation and even very hesitant or resistant. And we see our lead teachers getting worn down. So we decided to, to really work with our lead teachers, meaning people that were tapped out in our districts and, and um, charters, as well as some of our university professors that were doing a great job with instruction in mathematics and ling English language arts. 
And so we worked with them for um, over the course of a year, helping them in two things, really understanding the Common Core standards and getting into those with depth and complexity and practicing those in their own setting. And then we also worked with them simultaneously in adult learning theory so that we could ensure they knew how to turn around and work with adults. We always make an assumption that a, a great classroom teacher knows how to equally work well with adults, and we all, we all know that's not the case. So those were the two um, main strands of content that we worked with them on. This was done by bringing them together face to face, creating learning tasks, creating model lessons, sharing, sharing lesson, des lesson design with, with one another. Um, we had them actually construct new materials. In Utah, we've taken, you might have picked up on this in the video, we've decided to take an integrated approach to mathematics. And we're the only state to have adopted a statewide integrated model, meaning that rather than segmenting our uh, instruction in the secondary setting into algebra, geometry, and algebra two, it's an integrated model with really catchy names like secondary math one, two, and three. Uh, there was a lot of argumentation, as you might imagine, over the names. But in essence, it's a combination of algebra, geometry, and statistics so that the instruction that they're getting in kindergarten through eighth grade really um, starts to take root, and by the time they get to ninth grade, they really understand all of those concepts together, so they start to learn them with depth and complexity. Um, so, so the facilitators then came together and also designed the professional development for the summer, and it's just kind of a giant professional learning community. We have 120 facilitators that we have worked with over the course of a couple of years who are just doing amazing, amazing work in their own classrooms, but now leading other teachers in that work. Our core academies, this is the second year of our core academies for the Common Core, and we're really focused on mathematics this summer. Um, I used to be a dark brunette, and now I've got a lot of gray because we've been all over the, the we've, camp, we've been all over the um, state, canvassing the state with this work, and it's just been, I'm teasing about the hair color. Well, I'm really not, it's really gray. But um, we have had this amazing, amazing experience with teachers who feel really transformed. We've been in, we have 15 sites all over the state, so we're in the far reaches of San Juan County uh, with our reservation schools, as far north as you can get to our beautiful um, lakes in the north, and we're all over the place. We bring hundreds of teachers together to a large high school. Our facilitators work with uh, teachers in their content and at the grade level, so it's very specific. And they are engaged in the kind of work we expect them to do with their students. Um, we've only had a few people leave on the first day in one setting. We had three te sixth grade teachers leave who said, oh, I thought we were just going to get to sit and listen. If we have to do stuff, we don't want to be here. So other than that, we've had really positive response. We have the superintendent of the hosting district lay the groundwork and the expectations of this week-long academy. And, um, and then we have the administrators come and engage in the same work that their teachers are engaged in. So we've, uh, last year we worked with nearly 5,000 educators. And again this year, another 5,000. We have 38,000 teachers. But we've been very, very clear that this is not the professional development model. This is the first piece. This is the awareness piece. And then our role is to keep producing resources for our LEAs and serve as technical assistants so that they can then carry out the work and ensure that it gets to the classroom. So we're at the program implementation phase. We also have been some, uh, pioneers in the um, use of online education resources. This is kind of new territory, and it's confounding for a lot of our publishers. We feel like the first, for the first time ever, we're in control of our textbooks. We're not beholden to those of you from California or from Texas or those big states that the publishers work with. But our teachers are actually creating materials, these ma integrated mathematics materials, and placing them in an open format where teachers can take the materials and adjust them according to the needs of their students. And it's pretty exciting for, to see what's happening with these teacher-created materials. Um, of course, the challenge is how do you vet everything that's out there? There's so much out there now on the web. But um, we've kind of figured out some ways to do that. And again, these, these key teachers, these um, lead teachers and facilitators, have been really instrumental in that creation. Uh, one of the things that we have really focused on with our professional learning, again, is, as I mentioned, it's not so much 
giving them content and opening up the standards and having them dig into the standards, but getting at the heart of the kind of teaching and instruction that will ensure that the standards take root for every student. So one of the things we've been working on are these pedagogical, pedagogical practices um, that support that kind of learning. So we've really been digging into the teaching cycle and the learning cycle. And then last but not least, we are um, very explicit and transparent in talking to all educators in the system about change. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at one of our sites, and I threw up this change cycle. And you've, you've all seen a variety of change cycles. This, this actually comes from um, a company called The Change Cycle. And um, I really love how, it, how this particular cycle really helps us get clear about feelings and thoughts and behaviors of teachers. Because when administrators and coaches and mentors start to recognize those things in their teachers, then they know where to enter in and to help them move into that next phase. I think in Utah we can say that we're in the danger zone. And uh, our motto at the State Office of Education is that we're comfortable with chaos. Because it feels that way a little bit. Um, teachers are in that space of uh, ambiv not ambivalence, rather. They're thinking about wow, I'm a little skeptical about this, I'm anxious, I'm not sure, this is a different way of teaching, I'm unfamiliar with this. When they get into that danger zone, it's, it's that fertile ground for learning, and that's where we want them to be at some point. It's our job as leaders to help move them through that danger zone by giving them the kind of confidence and experience and resources they need so that they can move into a place of discovery, understanding, and integration. And it's been really um, insightful. This, play, this school I was at a couple of weeks ago, a teacher came up to me from the audience, and she said, that, that was just brilliant. And, and I'm thinking, I can't imagine what I said that was brilliant. But she said, I have never realized that the thoughts in my head and the feelings in my heart are my fear of change. I've never associated that with change. And she said, now I'll think about the kinds of behaviors I have as a teacher in the school in helping my colleagues go through this same change as we think about a new way of teaching and a new way of learning for our students. One of the, I'll give you a very specific strategy that we've been working on with our teachers. When you talk to educators in Finland and South Korea and Singapore, these high achieving countries in mathematics, one of the things that their students um, do that stands out very differently from our students is that they have perseverance when it comes to problem solving. And if you ask our teachers, could you work with students on a problem for a couple of hours until everybody gets it, they'll generally tell you, no, the hair would stand up on the back of my neck if I had to wait for two hours for all kids in my class to do it. But we're teaching them strategies to ensure that all students are really actively engaged in the mathematical task so that you don't have those early learners and quick learners in your classroom sitting and waiting while kids who it takes a minute to get it are struggling. But it's this sense of perseverance for all students so that they get to a place of confidence. And that's been a real shift for our teachers in, in giving them strategies and how to be patient. Um, so that's all part of this change process. I could go on for hours, and I think I've got about one minute. I will just say to you that the standards themselves will not create change. But helping teachers through high-quality professional learning get to a place where they recognize that they are responsible, they are the catalyst, they are the lever for change in all of our students so that all of our students can be college career ready is the key. I really am so proud to say that I'm the, I am the Linton member of the family, not in the will. I've known them for so long, that's kind of how I identify myself. <laughs> uh, but I really appreciate School Improvement Network, and I don't mean to do an infomercial. They've just been great, great partners throughout this process, and they've helped us with tools and resources to get through this change cycle. So I appreciate the opportunity to be at the summit and to rub shoulders with a lot of you and learn from you. Thanks.